So um, my name is Kelly Broadbent. I am predominantly employed by St Giles Trust as North Yorkshire Delivery Manager and currently on secondment for half of the week funded by the OPFCC to do the um, coordination of the whole system approach model to North Yorkshire. So just a bit of a, um, an insight into where we've learned best practice from. And um, there are these three areas, great which is rural like us and South Wales and England and um, South England have already got the approach in place a uh, whole system approach for women across the board albeit they've all got a completely different demographic um, and completely different um, funding um, pathways and ways that they've worked and pulled that together based on their own um, means there and obviously whether it's rural and built up so the biggest help for us I think from the information that I've sought was from Norfolk just because of its rurality and I think that's the thing the barrier that North Yorkshire faces the most is the rurality and then as well as that we've not got any um, funding to come into it to kind of entice partners to come in so it is very much um, everyone understanding what we can benefit from that moving forwards which is going exceptionally well. So on the back of that, the aims that we've got from uh, for North Yorkshire moving forwards is to work collaboratively across multi-agency network with joint aims and outcomes across York, York and North Yorkshire. What we aim to do is have a community-based holistic assessment, support and onwards referrals to meet multiple complex needs. Eradication of duplication, which will save time and resources across all agencies. The ease of referral processes for all agencies, saving time and resources for agencies. The women's centres in York and Scarborough, which we hope is coming into play, to be at the core of the model. Satellite drop-in sessions slash Liberty Links van to take services into the rural communities to eradicate the barriers that women are facing at the moment to engagement. End-to-end -end support for all women. Referrals for interventions realised at the very earliest of opportunities problem solving gender specific court days, sentences to involve women's services rather than unnecessary short term sentences, thus reducing the number of short term sentences. We know that um, when women are sent to prison for um, such as truancy, things like that, um, or TV license um, issues, then it's the woman that goes to prison for those offences. And um, more often than not, they've got childcare at home, the issues at home, no one to pick up those pieces. They've got the accommodation to sort out with the rent and things like that. So lots of issues around that that, it, that that proves it's really unnecessary for those short sentences to take place. So we've got from we've got connections in place at the moment to identify where they're on unnecessary short term sentences and how can we move past that. So that's actually moving in the right direction at the moment. Data collection to evidence the reality of hidden harms in rural areas. I think from a police perspective and beyond um, a domestic abuse perspective as well, we only know as multi-agencies what's reported um, and, and what's what we're aware of at the moment. And I think it's certain to say that there's so much that goes on beyond that. So we need to get out there and really identify and take the services to the women to, to, to get them to talk to us about what's going on, because we I don't think we've got any idea, particularly around domestic abuse, what is going on in those rural pockets. Introduction of a 360 safety plan recognised by all gender specific services. Um, that's a really big one that's coming into play. It's currently used in mental health services at the moment. Um, but to use that in a women only provision would prevent women having to um, go through their trauma and their circumstances and their triggers every single time they speak to a new agency. So I'll speak some more about that further down the line, but that's going to be really impactful and valuable. And to ensure that all professionals are trained in trauma informed approach. Studies and research is showing that actually that's not the case at the moment, which is quite concerning. So if we can carry that through and find a way of um, ensuring that all agencies and professionals are trauma informed approach trained, that would help the process massively. So Liberty Links launched. Um, this is the vehicle in the top corner. Um, and as you can see, there's a small kitchen space there. So we, we aim to park up in market days and offer tea, coffee, um toasties cakes things like that and there's a seating area for any confidential conversations that need to go on we can by all means take the take a lady on there we could even have a multi-agency meeting around that lady if needs be so the rural unit provision um is all about taking the multi-agency 
provision into the rural areas to eradicate the barriers. So in effect, it does what a women's centre does, but it takes the service out into the rural areas. So the initial pilot will take place in Rydale Market Towns, and that's Pickering on Mondays, Kirby Moorside on Wednesdays and Helmsley on Fridays. That will start at the beginning of August and we'll be parking up on or near to the market on market days between 10 and 2. This will likely evolve. Um, we don't really know what to expect, so this is just a starting point. We will be looking at it every quarter to see what's working well, what can be improved. So these things may and probably will change as we move forward. We need to get the best footfall and really make sure that we're, we're, we're reaching all women. So on the vehicle, there will be one Changing Lives member of staff and one St Giles Trust member of staff. Both will carry a caseload. There will be a rotor in place to coordinate multi-agency professionals to come along and meet the vehicle when it's stationary and packed up at the um, market days. By taking the services to women, we eradicate barriers, build trust in relationships and collect unknown data. Through the work that I have done um, via St Giles and the work that we do with women that are on probation, um, we have found and re research that I've done with the MOJ in female establishments, we found that women um, struggle to get from rural areas into built up areas um, because of the cost of public transport, because of the unreliability of public transport, because of the frequency on a, the lack of frequency of the transport. So, for example, if a lady has um, needs to get into town for an appointment, the bus into town might be at nine o'clock in the morning and the bus back might not be until four o'clock that afternoon, in which case she'll need money for lunch and she may also miss the school run as well to get back for. And even those buses are not necessarily going to turn up. So uh, things like that, mental health, people tend to um, not be confident enough to get on public transport. They may not feel confident enough to go into a built up area if they're used to being out in the rural areas where it's quiet. Um, abusive relationships, we know that people can be controlled. Um, lots of different factors that prevent ladies in rural pockets going out into the built up areas to engage with services in the local towns. So collect, un collect unknown data. Um, as the vehicle is out there, we will be collecting data um, for every person that we speak with. They, we will take um, we will signpost. We will just have chats, just normal chats. We will signpost to, uh, into agencies where it's appropriate. We will complete referrals. There will be laptops and phones on board the vehicle for ladies that might not feel safe to do it on their own devices. So we can access crisis lines through those devices. We can fill in referrals. We can help them with any IT issues that they might have. Um, so lots of opportunities for us to engage with people whilst we're out there. We'll offer hot drinks, toasties, like I'd said, and that will encourage engagement. So we will just be engaging with ladies that are passing by in that first instance to build those trusted relationships, get them to come in, have a chat, let them know that we're just there to look at what's going on in that area, what the services are like and what barriers people are facing. And hopefully that will encourage some more conversations on the back of that. We will also be... Um, We've got some leaflets that are very discreet. We're not publicising the service as a female only um, provision simply because we don't want to raise awareness to any perpetrators of domestic abuse that might then deter ladies from accessing it as a safe space. So we are quite discreet in the leaflets. What we will be doing is taking them into organisations such as GPs, chemists, food banks I've already done, schools, uh, children's centres, family hubs, supermarkets, hair salons, and um, North Yorkshire Police have already got some leaflets. Um, the fire service have already got some leaflets. So working closely with as many agencies that may come into contact with females that are in crisis. There's a space on the leaflet that they can then write um, that the Liberty Links vehicle will be in Kirby Moorside on Wednesdays between 10 and 2. There's an email address on there so they could also email in with contact details so that we can then call the lady and say, please do come on down. Because a lot of times they do need some encouragement to come down to know that they're welcome and it's safe. On board, we'll have sexual health products, sanitary products and toiletries on board. Um, we've got extensive promotional materials for all partner agencies as well. So we can always always got access to information to signpost on and give them that information. What I have found in um, whilst I've been going out and researching in these rural pockets is that the libraries and things like that don't have leaflets, nor do they have the knowledge of any services that are out there and available. So currently working with um, various agencies um, to build those opportunities so I can get into libraries and hopefully they'll stock some of these leaflets in there for ladies that do approach. 
So provision will evolve to fixed premises. What we don't want to do is take the vehicle out into a certain area and go, right, OK, we've collated this data now. Off we go on onto the next area and abandon those ladies that we've established relations with. So what we plan on doing is getting a fixed premise. So, for example, at Kirby Moorside, they're really keen to have us there. They've said that we can use their memorial hall should we want to moving forwards. So it might be that we then... Um, create a two-hour drop-in session that runs every week. Once you've identified need in that particular area, those specialist agencies can then continue with that via their own outreach service um, just for two hours per week and so on. So that that once we've established need and what is needed in that area, we can then put a more fixed premise in place, the vehicle then moves on to another area of need and so on. To give a little bit of background, um, the All About Respect project is uh, very different to, to Kelly's presentation when we're not a support organisation, we're, we're a project that started at York St John University with the aim of uh, focusing on awareness raising, early intervention and education in young adults, predominantly students, um, and that we're now developing slightly more to focus on those aged 16 to 25. So what I'm going to try and do uh, very briefly is just give a bit of an overview of All About Respect, um, some of the work that we've done in the past, some of the awareness raising work that we've done, and then how we're developing the project into a community wide network um, that we're hoping to deliver across the city of York initially. So the aim of All About Respect is um, to really focus on being a student led project which focuses on building and developing healthy relationships in order to strengthen the prevention of sexual violence, harassment and abuse. Our focus is on trying to help young people um, understand what is healthy and unhealthy. And if we can do that, does that help us to prevent some of the more problematic behaviours from developing in the longer term, particularly with a focus on uh, sexual har harassment, assault, partner violence? Uh, and more recently, we've also started to look at hate crime as well. So to give you a bit of an overview and a bit of background to, to what we've done, in the early days, um, we focus predominantly at York St John University, so the, the city centre campus, and also York College, uh, working with both staff and students um, to find out a little bit about their experiences, their knowledge and awareness of these issues. Um, we commissioned other organisations to develop and deliver training. Uh, we have our own bystander intervention training, which I'll talk about in a moment. We ran awareness raising campaigns. We had artwork, theatre pieces. But what's important about the project is that was all student led. So I can stand and, and talk about harassment and violence for hours. Uh, I've got 20 minutes. I won't do that now. But it would be meaningless to some of the young people. The, the language I use would probably be very different to the language that 16 year olds are using at the moment. So we wanted to make sure that our students were at the heart of the project and were able to develop campaigns and use language that was meaningful to the community. We also have a strand of research that goes alongside which focuses on uh, predictors of violence, outcomes to violence um, and what helps. So help seeking work, interventions and things like this. So in terms of our um, timeline and where we've been, as I said, we mainly focused at York St John initially and the project work really started um, back in 2016 because as academics, we have uh, a responsibility to provide tutoring to our students. And myself and my colleague Anna, alongside our wellbeing manager at the university at the time, were growing increasingly concerned about the number of disclosures we were receiving in terms of sexual violence, um, partner violence. We had no data, we had no way of collecting data at the time, um, but we were becoming increasingly aware, but also quite concerned about our abilities to respond to these disclosures. So this ran in parallel with the launch of a, a, a report that's known as the UUK Change in the Culture Report, which was um, a very high profile report, which really highlighted the prevalence of sexual violence on campus, um, how much goes on, how much we don't know about, um, and also just really a lack of awareness of what was going on. And on the back of that, All About Respect was launched. Um, we were funded at this time and we ran pretty much until pre-COVID times because we we're a very hands-on campaign, did a lot of awareness raising work, as I said, um, and lots of training as well. 
So the project um, really looks like this. Uh, lots of artwork, lots of materials that are about trying to help young people understand what do we mean by harassment? Where's the line between harassment and banter? Where's that line between a bit of fun and sexual assault? And it never stopped shocking me just how often we ran events, how often we ran bystander training. And on the feedback at the end of the events, students would turn around and say one of two things. First of all, I never realised what the legal definitions of these behaviours are. I didn't realise what harassment was. I didn't know what assault was. Uh, and this has been really helpful. And the second thing, which is really informing our work at the moment, is it's a real shame we had to wait till university to get this information. I've had experiences at school. I've had experiences with friends where they've shared things with me uh, and I needed to know more. Now, this is about six years ago. So in the past six years, I feel that we've moved on a great deal. The new RSE curriculum, we can probably debate for a great length, but is an attempt to try and tap into some of these things. But we still have a lot of students, a lot of young people tell us that they feel ill-equipped to deal with some of the relationship issues that they face when they come to university. So we do a lot of awareness raising campaigns. We've got flyers that have been made with uh, young people trying to highlight definitions of problematic behaviours, but also helping young people know where they can go to get help. Um, we very bravely one day uh, had an event on campus where we had a massive poster display. Um, this is the top left hand corner, which was on data that we collected with our students on the prevalence of sexual harassment, sexual assault and partner violence in our community. It was a massive awareness raising campaign and it was incredibly powerful for people just to look at them and go, gosh, I did not know that was going on on our campus and really fueled uh, a momentum to try and do something about it. We have had great buy in with our local sports teams who wear our all about respect laces uh, to try and just raise awareness of the branding and of the project um, more broadly. We do conferences. We did uh, a screening of a documentary called Audrey and Daisy. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you know about this, but just in case, Audrey and Daisy is a, a documentary that's available on Netflix uh, and it's quite a useful a documentary for starting a conversation about help seeking, about support and about challenging rape myths in particular. So we do screenings of things like this for students who are interested and then have panel discussions afterwards to really share sort of understanding uh, of some of these behaviours and some of these issues. We run regular artivism competitions, uh, which are an attempt to engage with the community to create um, images, um, theatre pieces, photographs, to try and capture a particular theme. So uh, one year we went quite broad and just did a all about respect uh, general theme. And these were our two winners uh, from that year, um, which the artists were saying depicted what they felt was a, an image of partner violence. And the other artist was uh, really keen to do something that focused on uh, sexual harassment and assault and challenging some of those myths. With their permission, we then use this material in our awareness raising campaigns um, because we feel it really resonates with our community uh, and with young people. As I mentioned, we also have bystander intervention training. So we were funded uh, to develop our training more broadly and take it out uh, across the community. And this was um, in 2019. We were ready to launch at the start of 2020 to run all our lovely in-person training only to be locked down. Uh, so we developed that training into online material uh, and including lots of things like infographics to try and summarise really simply what do we mean by a bystander? What are some steps for taking uh, action? Um, what types of things maybe stop people from intervening to really try and highlight what we mean by bystander intervention and try and share some of those uh, messages in an accessible way. It was at the launch of our bystander intervention training where the idea for our community network first started. Um, so this was June this time last year when we were approached by colleagues within the city um, because at this point the project was still very much at York St John. I'd moved over to the University of York and we were trying to work across the institutions um, but then we were invited to try and develop this into a community-wide network. 
Alongside um, our bystander training, we do a lot of research um, and this is some of the material that we've produced in terms of the prevalence uh, of different behaviours, but also young people's stories in terms of them telling us about their experiences. And I'll happily share all of this later because I'm aware that's a lot of text to get through uh, in 10 minutes. Do we feel the project is helpful? Um, I'm a bit of a number cruncher, so I like numbers, but even though these data are helpful, what these data tell us is if we look at the bottom line, we're seeing a change in terms of what we call the action scores. So action in terms of a behaviour change uh, programme is when people are moving away from not getting involved in interventions, not really doing something to tackle a particular issue, but actually engaging in some action to try and tackle a problematic behaviour. And over three years of our project, we gathered data from students to see whether the, whether they were in the pre-contemplative stage. So basically, they weren't aware of sexual harm as a problem. They weren't aware of gender based violence. They, they had no real understanding of that as an issue. And what you can see is that those scores have gradually gone down over a three year period. The contemplative is just a, a more um, a greater awareness of the issue. But the one we really want to see change is this action score. And we see that change over the course of our project. We also have um, points from our students who tell us that they feel that the project has really been helpful for them. It's made them feel more confident on nights out, felt safer, but also that the awareness raising, the posters that we use are really helpful and really resonate with our student community. More than any of the data that we've gathered, more than any of these sort of um, anecdotal quotes that we've collected, conversations with students have made us aware that the branding, the All About Respect logo means something to our community. They know when they see it that it's going to include information about gender based violence, about interpersonal violence, about hate crime. So they know what to expect. They know it will be something to do with consent or awareness raising. So it's come to mean something and it's become quite a powerful brand in terms of raising awareness. I currently work for North Yorkshire Council um, and my role is to look at the Domestic Abuse Act and the statutory duties for the council. Uh, and what that has also encompassed now is obviously VORG and, and a, a number of work streams that the council are leading on um, around safe accommodation uh, and the safe accommodation strategy and some of the duties under part four of the Domestic Abuse Act. So, so why are we talking about Horton um, as, a, as a pilot? This came about from the safe accommodation needs assessment, which is a, a legislative requirement. This was done back in October the year before in 21, where we recognised that actually we were not capturing quite a significant piece of data around some of our marginalised communities, one of those being uh, Gypsy Roma Traveller communities. Uh, we have a long standing relationship with Horton Housing uh, and they manage a number of our sites across North Yorkshire. Uh, just as a, just as some clarity, this is a North Yorkshire pilot. It doesn't currently include York um, and, and I know that York themselves and their public health colleagues over there are also watching this with a great deal of interest. Um, so I'm going to talk you through what the pilot's about, um, what Horton, a bit about Horton um, and then our way forward, but I'm probably also going to talk about some of the limitations at the moment of this pilot uh, and the vulnerabilities that I see as a, as a commissioner really in this particular piece of work. So I'm going to get straight into it. Um, so what about what do we know about Horton? So Horton manage 30 different housing training and support services across West Yorkshire and North Yorkshire. Uh, they're a non-profit, not-for-profit organisation um, that provides housing training, not just for Gypsy Roma traveller communities, but also homelessness, mental health, drug and alcohol and young people and older people, etc. So it's a really broad um, uh, organisation that also looks at disabilities and ex-offenders. Now, when I talked about the scope and scale of this uh, pilot, uh, Horton themselves are um, managing four of our sites across North Yorkshire. They look at the top end of the ground, which is Fursk, and Stokesley, so we've got two sites up there, and we've got 
Bolton and Burn down in the south of the county. And ultimately, we've got 56 families that are living within those communities. Across Northfield, Yorkshire, we have about eight sites. Um, so, so when I talk about the scale of this, these are the sites that are managed by the, uh, the Horton Housing uh, Organisation. So we've just got about 50% of our resident traveller community that are covered by this, uh, this GRT ISVA, ISVA pilot. The domestic abuse pilot has been uh, commissioned by North Yorkshire um, under the domestic abuse, well, within the kind of remit of the safe accommodation strategy. Um, it is a Gypsy Roma Traveller ISVA, ISVA support service. So what that means is we have two members of staff within Horton that are now ISVA and ISVA trained specialists. This role has taken on one member of staff, which is Helen McKinder, who herself is a survivor of domestic abuse. Helen is an absolute um, tenacious woman that has become involved with this pilot. She's been uh, employed specifically by Horton alongside the existing site manager, Nikki Lamb, who herself now is an ISVA, ISVA and obviously the ISVA bit is the bit that we're training now. Um, and this is bespoke to those four sites. Uh, and it's, you know, the scheme is, is traditionally engaged uh, to reach out to these communities and provide awareness of domestic abuse, promote safe and healthy relationships and to ensure there's a voice heard to inform future service delivery. So what this approach is, we've taken, or certainly Horton have led on, is what we've talked about in the other spotlight themes today. It is a trauma-based, strength-based approach um, what does that mean in reality? This is hugely about building trust within this community. One of probably the most hardest to reach communities that we've got in North Yorkshire. It's about empowering women and children and girls on these sites to make informed decisions. It's about trying to make them feel safe. It's about having that culturally sensitive language um, to kind of get people to open up and feel safe and trusted. And again, it looks at to being delivered by specially trained members of staff. But again, I come back to this is to scan the pilot. It is two members of staff. So what do we see within the Gypsy Roma Traveller community? This is going to be no surprise to many people on this call, what we've identified through this piece of work. Male dominated culture. It's accepted as normal for many women that live within these traveller communities. Not recognised as abuse. Very rarely do um, these Gypsy Roma traveling families become divorced. There is the similar base of shame that we see in some other communities around honour based violence. What we also have seen is that, and, and particularly in relation to this pilot, where uh, um, it, if there is domestic abuse, then the, the woman is forced to leave the community entirely. And we've seen some of that from other areas of South Yorkshire where females have then come across to North Yorkshire to flee. Historical lack of awareness of services available and links to mental health issues and suicide within these communities.